Has the world gone crazy? Life is difficult. When you need help, where do you turn? Are you willing? Are you willing to let him blow on the coals of your heart? Are you willing? Are you willing to ignite that flame? To let him blow and ignite that flame? And set you on fire. And set you on fire to consume this county, to consume this state, to consume this world. Welcome. Christian Impact, impacting your life with spiritual truth. I am Dr. Kelly Blanton, and I'm sharing practical truths in the Bible that can truly change your life. Today is May 24th, 2023. We continue our series, Words for Life. Today's word is entrusted. So, before we get into talking about being entrusted, let's talk about our world a little bit. We seem to be living in a culture, a society that is becoming more and more hostile to the gospel. So what does it mean for us to live in such a culture? How do you feel living in a culture that sometimes seems hostile? And when I mean hostile, I mean hostile to you as a Christian. Because today we're talking about being entrusted and we have been entrusted as Christians, with a great commission from Jesus Christ. And so, if we're going to talk about being entrusted, we also have to talk about our culture becoming hostile. And so, what does it mean to be sent out, to be entrusted with such a task into this world and not be overcome by its evil? You know, have you protected yourself by isolation Or do you feel like you're boldly stepping into the world in truth? Are we really prepared for the hostility that awaits us? Yes, being of the world, but being in the world, but not of the world, it's a challenge. It's a challenge of biblical proportions. (laughs) Ha ha, literally. Um, It is a biblical proportion mandate. But the challenges are biblically proportional. And since it's a biblical mandate, maybe we should be facing biblical style challenges. But I know that's, it's it's fun to laugh at and poke fun of with our words, but it can be challenging. And we're seeing the hostility in our world grow exponentially to those who hold a biblical worldview. So as Christians who have been entrusted with the gospel, how should we face this hostile society, this hostile world? You know, sometimes it can be a challenge putting together the message for the series this year because I'm taking scriptures from the lectionary reading, and these have been decided a long time ago not just years, but the lectionary has been around for hundreds of years. And so how can I take lectionary readings that have been pre-decided and find messages about our culture today? Well, it's a challenge. It means spending time with the Lord and then listening, listening to the Holy Spirit as we read these and having him teach something fresh from scriptures that I'm not getting to decide upon. And so today, we're going to talk about how do we face such a hostile culture with the gospel that we are entrusted with. Because that's that's the word today. It's the word the Lord has given, I think, today for us, for you and I, that we are entrusted with something. So I want us to look at three scripture passages. One from the book of Acts, chapter 1, verses 12 through 26. We begin, it says, Then they, it's talking about the disciples, returned to Jerusalem from the mount called Olive, which is near Jerusalem, a Sabbath day journey. And when they had entered, they went up to the upper room where they were staying. Peter, James, John and Andrew, Philip and Thomas, Bartholomew, Matthew, James the son of Alphaeus, and Simon the zealot, and Judas the son of James. These all continued with one accord, 
in prayer and supplication with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and with his brothers. And in those days, Peter stood up in the midst of the disciples. Altogether, the number of names was about 120 and said, Men and brethren, the scripture had to be fulfilled, which the Holy Spirit spoke before by the mouth of David concerning Judas, who became a guide to those who arrested Jesus. For he was numbered with us and obtained a part of this ministry. Now this man purchased a field with the wages of iniquity, and falling headlong he burst open in the middle, and all his entrails gushed out. And it became known to all those dwelling in Jerusalem, so that the field is called in their own language, Akodama, that is, filled of blood. For it is written in the book of Psalms, Let his dwelling place be desolate, and let no one live in it, and let another take his office. Therefore, of these men who have accompanied us, all the time that the Lord Jesus went in and out among us, beginning from the baptism of John to that day when he was taken up from us, one of these must become a witness with us of his resurrection. And they proposed two, Joseph called Barsabbas, whose surname was Justice, and Matthias. And they prayed and said, O Lord, you who know the hearts of all, show which of these two you have chosen. Take part in this ministry and apostleship from which Judas by transgression fell, that he might go to his own place. And they cast their lots, and the lot fell on Matthias, and he was numbered with the eleven apostles. Okay, so we pick up with this passage in Acts. And this is the very early church. 120 members. Here they are. They had just experienced the resurrection of Jesus. They were the first believers. They were experiencing new life. And they would, had come upon this, this point. It was both exciting and scary. Jesus had now ascended into heaven. And he had entrusted them with his ministry. He had entrusted them to take the gospel to the world. And they were excited for this, but they were also scared. This is before the Holy Spirit is poured out upon them. They don't have the boldness the Spirit of God brings yet. But they're excited. They want to. But at the same time, they're consumed with the responsibility of the task. And they're still aware that there's hostility. There's still people that want to kill them out there. And so there is this anxiety. And so they gather together in the upper room. And what do they talk about? Well, they want to talk about this commissioning. They're, they're, they're thinking about it. And it, it's indirectly talked about here because they become consumed with making sure they have a complete number of apostles for the mission. Because Judas Iscariot had committed suicide because he betrayed Jesus. Now, there was a Judas in the group that was son of James. That's not the same as Judas Iscariot. So there's now 11 of them. And they're more consumed about how are we going to do this with 11 of us instead of maybe thinking, how can 12 make a difference? You're going to need God. You're going to need something more than just 12 people. One more is not going to make a difference. But they just, they, they were looking at their inadequacies. And the first thing that they saw that they could talk and debate and discuss in their lack was, well, we need another person. And so they came up with rules. Well, who can or can't be? Well, he needs to be one that was there from the time Jesus was baptized by John the Baptist up until the time he ascended into heaven. He had to be with us the whole time. And, and so they came up with two names. And they prayed and they, they threw lots because that's what they did before the Holy Spirit. You know, the last time you ever see lots mentioned being cast to know God's will is right here. Because the Holy Spirit is poured out in the second chapter. Never again does the church use lots because we can now talk directly to God. We have the Spirit of God and we can talk directly to Him. But up to this point... That was not really possible. And so they did what they'd done in the past in the Old Testament. They, they cast lots. They were forgetting a little bit about some of the things Jesus taught them. They cast lots. It falls on Matthias. And so he completes their number. 
Now, there's lots of debate. Some people think that that was a mistake and that Paul was the next one. But I, I just want to point out that at this point forward, Matthias was always known as an apostle. He was numbered and named with the apostles. So he's really the first example of an apostle outside of the the 12 picked by Jesus. Um, he's not the only one that will be added to that number. There were other people that become known as apostles in the book of Acts. So we see that, but the word apostle means sent one. That's all an apostle means. He is a sent one. And we as believers, we're all in a sense sent. I'm not saying we're all apostles, but we've been entrusted with this ministry. And there will, there will be more in Acts that will be entrusted with that responsibility. But I, I wanted to, to, to look at this because these men were entrusted and they were living in a hostile society much like we are living in a hostile society let's look at first peter chapter 4 verses 12 through 9 and then we're going to skip down and go to chapter 5 verses 6 through 11 so beginning with chapter 4 verses 12 through 19 it says beloved do not think it strange concerning the fiery trial, which is to try you as though some strange thing happened to you, but rejoice to the extent that you partake of Christ's sufferings, that when his glory is revealed, you may also be glad with exceeding joy. If you are reproached for the name of Christ, blessed are you, for the spirit of glory and of God rests upon you. On their part, he is blasphemed, but on your part, he is glorified. But let none of you suffer as a murderer, a thief, an evildoer, or a busybody in other people's matters. Yet if anyone suffers as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God in this matter. For the time has come for judgment to begin at the house of God. And if it begins with us first, what will be the end of those who do not obey the gospel of God? Now if their righteous one is scarcely saved, where will the ungodly and sinner appear? Therefore, let those who suffer according to the will of God commit their souls to him in doing good as to a faithful creator. Chapter 5, verses 6 through 11. Therefore, humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you in due time, casting all your care upon him, for he cares for you. Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary the devil walks about like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. Resist him, steadfast in the faith, knowing that the same sufferings are experienced by your brotherhood in the world. But may the God of all grace, who calls us to his eternal glory by Christ Jesus, after you have suffered a while, perfect, establish, strengthen, and settle you. To him be the glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Now we have two sections. And it's interesting because we're talking about hostility in a, in a hostile society. But we're also entrusted. We're entrusted to be a witness for Jesus. To spread the gospel. To speak truth. And so First Peter, um, he in those first portion, he, he addresses the hardship of facing such a culture. That we should, if we're going to suffer in life, we should suffer for the name of Jesus. We are blessed when this happens. We shouldn't suffer because of we're murderers or blasphemers or I like it, busybodies in someone else's business. You know, we, we covered this in the message last week. It's not a popular subject, but it must be spoken about. Listen, we live in a fallen world. Everyone's going to suffer. Everyone is going to suffer at some point. I know we don't want to hear that. And yes, God is good. God has a plan for our lives. God has a future and good things for us. But the Bible is pretty clear in preparing us and telling us, listen, you're going to suffer trials and hardships. But we have a choice. Do we want to suffer for Jesus, or do we want to suffer because we earned our suffering? 
You know, if we do evil things, we, we earn it. We, you know, how can we cry and complain about suffering when we're, we're doing it? If, if you're lying, if you're cheating, if you're an adulterer, you're running around having sex outside of marriage and you're getting venereal diseases, how can you, how can you complain about a situation to God? You've earned it. You murder someone and suddenly you have to pay the consequences of that action. How can you complain? You, you've earned that. There's no blessings in that. There's no blessings in that suffering. You're, you're getting exactly what you deserve. But when we come to Jesus and he cleanses us and he cleans us from our sin, and then we stand up for him and we, 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 we try to live life like he did and we suffer for the message we suffer for the life we're suddenly blessed because god's going to give us a reward he's going to reward us see there's no punishment you know we're not deserving we're suddenly rewarded see there's there's a difference there there's a difference in that and and that's what peter's trying to tell us listen you've been entrusted with a message that if you suffer because you've been entrusted, there is a reward for you. God is going to be glorified and he's going to reward us for that because he's faithful. He tells us, humble ourselves before him in those times. Listen, your devil, the devil, your adversary, he's, he's a, he's like a, this lion seeking to devour you. He's out there looking to cause you trouble. What should we do? We should resist him. We should stand fast in our faith. We should know that any suffering that befalls upon us, listen, you're not alone. Sometimes I know when bad things happen to us, we think we're the only one in the world dealing with this. We're not. And and, and the Lord is telling us that you're not, you're not alone. You're not alone in your suffering. Jesus suffered. You have brothers and sisters in Christ around the world that are suffering. But you know what? The God of grace, he's going to perfect us. He's going to strengthen us. He's going to settle us. He says, settle you. You know, that means he's going to put a peace that passes understanding upon us. That suddenly we, 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 we can see things that we can't normally see with our human eyes. He settles us. He puts peace in us. Because why? Because we, we have an eternal home. We have eternal rewards that's coming to us. And it's because he's entrusted us with his gospel, with his message. It's, it's powerful. God is going to restore to us the things that this devil tries to steal and rob and destroy. God's going to bless us. He really is. Now let's look at our last scripture passage, John chapter 17, verses 1 through 11. Jesus spoke these words, lift up his eyes to heaven and said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your son, that your son also may glorify you as you have given him authority over all flesh that he should give eternal life to as many as you have given him. And this is eternal life that they may know you, the only true God and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. I have glorified you on the earth. I have finished the work you have given me to do. And now, O father, glorify me together with yourself, with the glory which I had with you before the world was. I have manifested your name to the men whom you have given me out of the world. They were yours. You gave them to me, and they have kept your word. Now they have known all the things which you have given me are from you. For I have given to them the words which you have given me, and they have received them, and have known surely that I came forth from you, and they have believed that you sent me. I pray for them. I do not pray for the world, but for those whom you have given me, for they are yours. And all mine are yours, and yours are mine, and I am glorified in them. Now I am no longer in the world, but these are in the world. And I come to you, Holy Father, keep through your name those whom you have given me, that they may be one as we are one. 
Okay, so here we are. Jesus prays for us. He prays and says that he has completed his work. The work that the Father has entrusted to him, he has completed. And he is now entrusting his work to us. That all the words the Father has given to him, he's now given to us. We have been entrusted to carry forth the message. We are entrusted with carrying forth the word of God, the truth. He's leaving us to accomplish this work. And he prays for us. He doesn't pray for the world. Think about this. Jesus doesn't pray for the world. He prays for you and I as believers. Listen, has the Father ever not answered the prayer of Jesus? Did the Father ever say no to Jesus? Anything Jesus asked for the Father would readily give him. Jesus even said when they came to get him that if he wanted 12 legions of angels, his father would have given it. He didn't have to go to the cross. Jesus chose. He willingly chose because if he would have asked, it would have been given. If he would have asked for the cup to pass him, it would have, but he didn't. He, he surrendered that will. But nothing that Jesus ever asked for in prayer was denied. And now... He's praying for you and I, not the world, but for us. What's he, what's he praying for us? See, he's in trust. He's praying for us because he's entrusting us with something incredibly important and powerful. And he's pouring out his heart. This is the love of him in praying because remember, he's asking is not going to be denied. And so he prays for us. So what is he? pray specifically for you know he prays that we would have power protection and unity i know you're saying where do i see that well just in verse 11 let me grab my paper here verse 11 it says he says now i am no longer in the world but these are in the world and i come to you holy father keep through your name those you have given me that they may be one as we are they may be one. That's unity. He's praying that we'd have unity. He says, keep through your name. Keep. That's protection. He's praying protection that the, the Holy Father would keep us. We'd be protected. And we're protected through your name. That's the power of God. The name of God is the power of God. It's, it's, it's his name upon which that protection comes. It's the, it's, the, it's the name of which we're proclaiming. That, that is the very power of God. When we tell people that Jesus can save them and they believe that, it's the name of Jesus that provides power to save them, to deliver them, to heal them. That's, that's, that's what Jesus has, has prayed for us. He's in, and he's done it because he is entrusting you and I, was something so important. I know this is a different type of talk, but listen, Jesus loves us. He does have a plan for a lot. He has entrusted us to carry forth his message, the gospel. And yes, we're living in a world where society is hostile, where culture is becoming more hostile, where the spirit of Antichrist is loose. But listen, because he's entrusted us, he's, he's prayed for us. And we know what the answer is. It has been provided, the protection of God, the power of God, and we should be one. Father, I thank you for today, God, for those listening, God. Father, I pray, God, that you would comfort their heart. That, Father, that your protection would be upon them, God, the, to, to speak the truth, God to walk and turn the world upside down as those disciples in the early church. Father, pour out your power, God, boldness upon their life, God, the ability to speak your words, God, and keep them, Lord, from the harm that the enemy would like to put on them. And Lord, help us to be one. As brothers and sisters, help us not to fight with one another, God. There is no competition, God. It's not about whose church is bigger, God, because it all belongs to you. 
and we're just members of your family and servants, God. Lord, I thank you, God, that you are moving in our midst, God. Lord, speak to us, protect us, empower us, and make us one. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you for listening to this podcast. Words for Life is our series. You can check out other teachings at our website, www.christianimpact.net. And until next time, God bless.